In our feature-length documentary of the wreck of the Atlantic, we spend some time talking about the boat ride out to the wreck site of the ship that we took, out near a remote island off the shore of Lower Prospect in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This was a very unique experience, and we shared the highlights in the main video, but I wanted to share as much of that tour with you as we can in this bonus video. We were taken out by Bob Chalk, SS Atlantic author and historian, on his personal boat. We started off in Terrence Bay and made our way south with our first stop being the shores of Lower Prospect itself. This is Lower Prospect and this is the uh, village where most of the people involved in the rescue came from. So we'll uh, track the, the route that they took on the way back, because we're, but we're going to go out a different way. That house over there is the Norris house, so that belonged to Richard Norris, who was one of the rescue people, one of the first on site. And his descendant, Joe Norris, is a well-known local uh, folk artist. <clears throat> now Richard Norris, I'm trying to remember now, he arrived with Edmund Ryan, who lived out on Ryan's Island, I'll show you where he lived, and he was really the person who led the rescue, was, was Edmund Ryan. He was the Justice of the Peace for Lower Prospect and Terence Bay. Uh, so uh, he took care of all the bodies when they were taken out, identified them all, documented their belongings that they had on them. So he, could, he would identify them, you know, if they had a, like a, uh, I don't know, some, some sort of an ID on their person. So his mother also lived on the island and there's a, a story in one of the Halifax newspapers that she was very traumatized by the whole thing. Uh, because at the time there were about 200 bodies literally on her doorstep right outside of her house on an area called the Hill of Death. I'll show that to you as we go over here where they, where they stored the bodies as they picked them up. So the big one up ahead would be Mars Island? No, that's Betty's Island. We're not going there. So that light on Betty's Island often uh, gets erroneously uh, identified as the light that they, they were looking for. That light was actually put there after the wreck. And I don't believe it was necessarily as a result of the wreck. Uh, it was scheduled to be built uh, by the federal government and they built it. But it was not there at the time of the wreck. And many of the keepers uh, over the years were descendants of Michael Clancy, who was the uh, person living on Mars Island. Now this is, this is, I'm having a hard time here because there's a major reef runs out there and the waves are always breaking on it, but there's not enough waves today for you to see it. Uh -oh. See, we're worrying about the same dangers that sank the ship. Yeah. And that is the rock she struck right there. That's Golden Rule Rock. That's right Golden Rule Rock right there, yeah. So she struck there and then she slid over there and sank. So when they took the boats out, so the bow of the ship was out there, that's where they took them off of. I think they would have gone from that cove, that's my thinking. But it could have been over there on the other side of the rock too. I'm really not sure. Where's she laying right now? Over there. See that black buoy? Oh uh, yes. That's our buoy that we use to tie off of when we dive. So the wreck lies, the, uh, the bottom is like the shore, it, in that it uh, has ledges and whatnot, it's very, very rough, a lot of huge boulders on the bottom that uh, beat the snot out of the wreck every winter, uh, what's left of it. So starting about here, you've got uh, just plates just lying flat on the bottom, covered in kelp and so on. If you were not used to the wreck, you'd miss it. So going in towards that buoy, basically, uh, you have, a, a, again, a lot of, uh, uh, the bank goes down to about 60, 70 feet. And then it finally levels off at 80 feet. And at about here, the boilers, the only thing that's sticking up, and they are very heavily deteriorated. There are at least five, the ashes of at least five divers on there that I know of. I put two of them there. Really? Yeah, guys who love the love the wreck. This is a very significant wreck for a lot of uh, a lot of local divers. Uh, a lot of folklore associated with, of course. What I'm having trouble finding is the rocks that she struck before she struck Golden Rule Rock. There are none here, so 
that's too tight for her to strike there. Right. You know? So I don't really, I'm trying, I can't figure out. And you know, that's the description. That's what they testified in the inquiry. That's what the people who were interviewed, you know, the people who, uh, the passengers and so on, they heard this rumble which they thought was the anchors going out. because They thought they were in Halifax and the anchors were going out. And then seconds after that, they were literally brought up standing. They were thrown out of their beds when she struck the rock. So I don't know where the heck the rocks are that she, um, that she would have struck. One theory from the fishermen of the time was that they struck something called the Grampus out there. So in a straight line out there, that water on the horizon is very, very shallow and the ship would, and if you look at it on the chart, strangely enough, uh, I was looking at the chart and I thought, hmm, I wonder if she struck, she could, could have struck the Grampus, and then, you know, in, in the testimony, we don't get a feel for the amount of time that, that, that occurred, and lo and behold, uh, one of the guys told me that that was a theory at the time from, uh, from some of the fishermen who thought that she might have struck there. How far is that? It's probably a mile. Uh, she was traveling 14 knots. Okay. You know, if she, if she had done that, uh, you know, it would probably be, have been a couple of more minutes then before they actually saw the shore. They probably saw the shore along there. So she would have come in past this point and struck Golden Rule Rock right there. It's hard to know if they're going perfectly straight when they struck or if in the last minutes, for example, the officer of the watch said hard to starboard because they thought that the land was to their left because they were they, they thought they were supposed to be you know about 15 miles away in that direction and if they were striking the land the, the mainland it would have been on their left so the last thing they expected was to see land on their right I'm and gonna give you one more thing from the Titanic though yeah. um, just when I read it, you're probably right, you know this a lot better than I do, but when I read it, I interpreted hard to starboard as hard to port in modern terms because on the Titanic, they were using tiller commands. Hard to starboard meant literally turn the ship to port. Really? Yep, they, they testified that. They always shouted hard to starboard and literally just meant turn to port. Because they I all trained on tiller that. ships. No, they all trained on tiller ships and just like here, you yeah. turn it hard to the starboard side yeah. Yeah. and it turns the ship to the port. This is just coming from the Titanic, you know, so yeah. I, I don't know about there, but I know that they trained White Star Line to use tiller commands up until about World War One. So we're gonna look into that. Yeah. And so when the when the uh, they started getting on the rock, it was around 4 a.m. They got the rope in from the from the ship. So they started going across on the line, and uh, of course they had to claw their way up onto the rock. So my thinking is that the rock was about like that, and then the tide was started to come in. And the big danger was that they would be, people were being swept off the rock, but there were at, at one time supposedly a hundred men on that rock, which is hard to believe. But the big rush was, so when the boat, the first boat went out, James Coolen's boat, and they started taking men off the rock because the rock was almost, you know, it was starting to get submerged. And the captain was on the ship and he was all nervous that the ship was going to founder and there was only one boat. So he yelled out to them and told them to come and take them off the ship because they were in greater danger on the ship than they were on the rock. Of course, from his point of view, they looked like they were ashore practically, so, you know, what's up with this? And he yelled out that he would pay 500 pounds for every boatload that, uh, that they took from the ship. And uh, so at about that time, a second boat came. So they had one boat on the rock and one, one tending to the ship. I was curious about that. No. Did he ever they, pay? No. After about a month and a half, the uh, men involved in the rescue took it to the Court of Vice Admiralty because they had been promised great rewards and they got nothing. Uh, they went to the Court of Vice Admiralty and uh, they each got around between 50 and 100 dollars, which at the time was okay, uh, but it was paid for the, uh, by the Canadian taxpayer, not by the White Star Line. Right. So that's Norris Island. And this is Ryan's Island. So this was on our left coming out, now it's on our left again because we're going back. Where's that hill of death? Right there. 
So it makes sense, you know, this, this is theoretical, of course, this is, you know, but this is the only, this is the nearest place of calm water from the wreck. So they were picking up bodies, fishing them out of the water in dories, which is a small rowboat about 16 feet long. So they would row them down and in here and pile them. And they, the, I think it was the newspapers called it the Hill of Death. And based on what I was just telling you about uh, uh, Edmund Ryan's mother, uh, you know, being, uh, being stressed by having all the bodies around, uh, her house was in here, so that, that that's how we conclude that was the hill of death. Where was their house? In here, where that one is. <laughs> My guess is, like I say, you know, it might have been right there, but it was along here somewhere. <clears throat> and, you know, like I say, I, I think that they were all over the place. I think they were probably on Norris Island as well. So, you know, there were over, uh, over 500 bodies, you know, that were brought in. They would have been taken ashore, so from here we'll be covering what I think was the route during the night of the rescue. So Edmund Ryan lived right there. When Robert Thomas, he was the first man ashore, he was the quartermaster who was at the wheel when she struck. It wasn't his fault, he was doing what he was told. Um, <clears throat> but he was the first man ashore and he met Michael Clancy, who was on his way towards the wreck to find out what the heck's going on. He was awakened by the sound of uh, steam and uh, the rockets, the distress rockets that they fired. The first thing he did was took Thomas back to the house because Thomas was freezing, he was soaking wet, and he got a boy named Richard Mullins, who would have been 10 or 11 years old, to take a dory and row over to Mr. Ryan's house, as she called it, and that would have been right here. So that boy in the middle of the night rode from over in the cove over there on the other side of that, that cottage, rode over, uh, roused uh, Ryan, who came then with Richard Norris and uh, his brother, I think, Dennis Ryan. Uh, they, they then came over to Clancy's house. So this is where Michael Clancy would have lived in this cove. And my guess is that he lived straight ahead because the water is deep here. He had a 54-ton schooner, uh, which he would have had to anchor in the winter. So, I, I, and the water, he can actually get out. There's no way he could go that way uh, in a schooner. So he would have. That's the way out to the to the fishing out that way. They would have had a number of buildings here. You know, they would have had uh, a store. What's called a stage, which is a fishing supplies uh, and equipment building that would be on a wharf. And they would have had what are called stores, which uh, is not a store where you buy something, but a place where you store equipment. So a fisherman would have, you know, three or four outbuildings in addition to his house. And the house would often be not much bigger than the outbuildings. The captain referred to Clancy's house as a hut. Um, I don't know if he meant to uh, be putting him down or not, but uh, it sounded like it to me. <laughs> But now they were in the buildings too, and uh, and Edmund Ryan talked about how he used to have to chase them out of the house because uh, Sarah Jane O'Reilly, who is Michael Clancy's daughter, she's the, the real heroine of the wreck, uh, one of them, um, because there were several women who got medals and so on and rewards. She would place them around the stove, give them some tea or, or something, place them around the stove. They were shivering, of course, no clothes on, basically. And as uh, soon as they got warmed up, well, before they got warmed up, there'd be another crowd coming. So the boat, there were three boats, and they were taking loads of eight to ten men at a time in each boat. So you get some idea of the... Uh, the pace at which they were coming up to the house. And as soon as, uh, you know, they were revived at all, Edmund Ryan said, I had to chase them out of the house. And uh, they'd get in a boat then and get rowed over to Ryan's Island. And there, Elizabeth Ryan and her two daughters, Emma and Ellen, would give them something to eat. And then they would be taken to, to the mainland. So by then, there were men down from, rescue crew down from uh, Upper Prospect, because that was the third, the third boat. The first boat was, was you know, the, guy, the first people on site, Edmund Ryan himself was in it. And the second boat came about a half an hour later, and then probably an hour and a half later was the third boat. 
and that was the one Nicholas Christian's boat. <laughs> there was someone holding up a sign saying the boats are coming. Yeah. What was the story of that? Uh, I don't know if I believe that. Okay, yeah. Uh, supposedly, it was um, uh, Cornelius Brady, the third officer. And so from the point of view of the ship and the crew, he's the hero. Brady is the hero from, from, from that group. There was a, um, a drawing done in, in one of the newspapers um, of him saying, cheer up, the boats are coming, uh, supposedly. And the description that you, I read in one book, you know, that it was, they, they put it in the sand on the beach. Well, you saw the quote-unquote yeah. beach, right? So that's what happens, right? You, you know, and when you read stuff like that, you think, well, I don't know if I believe any of it. But it's possible that something was done. But again, on this island in 1873, where you had uh, a hand-to-mouth fisherman living, where is he going to get markers or whatever to make a sign? Right now, it could have been paint, but it's, uh, I would say his house probably was not painted. You know, because uh, I've heard stories of my own relatives uh, painting their house, houses with red ochre and seal oil. You know, to uh, homemade paint, as it were. I'm looking at these this rocky coast right here, and it's 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 really kelp covered and I can't imagine in the high seas how difficult it would really be to just have to climb out of the freezing cold water. You're already exhausted from getting away from the ship and now you gotta climb up these rocks while being beaten by waves. I just can't imagine how difficult that is. It's, it's really no surprise that so many people were swept away. Into that land there, that's Pennant Point, and uh, about there, right over the point, is the light that they were looking for, the Sambro light. So, you know, it was a long ways from where they finally ended up. At the end of it, they might, the, the point might have blocked the light when they, when they got in too far, but they definitely should have seen it for at least an hour. But they, you know, they were concentrating to their left when the, the light was in fact on their right. The boat tour lasted about two hours and really put the story into context, showing us how the coastline looked better than any satellite images could show, and helped us to better understand how it would have been to struggle off of the wreck, across ropes, onto a submerged rock, and then onto Mars Island itself. Getting out to Mars Island for the first time was an unforgettable experience for all of us.